Uh, well, um, today I, I would like to... Uh, can you hear me? No. Oh, no, it's not on. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, I would like to talk about uh, another organelle, the nuclear core complex, which mediates traffic in and out of the nucleus. And as I already said to you yesterday, unlike the protein conducting channel, and I apologize for those who already have heard Tom Rappaport a few weeks ago showing you negatively stained images of this, of this creature of the protein conducting channel. I just took you through this exercise because it was those experiments which really finally convinced the public that there is a protein conducting channel. And since very few people have read the papers, um, and since very few people knew, because those mostly get turned off and they see electrophysiological traces, uh, uh, I, I felt it was very important uh, to, to give you an understanding how the concept of the protein conducting channel really came about. And what I would like to say is that at this moment, the two-dimensional reconstruction negatively stained the protein conducting channel. This is still, there's still no proof that it is a channel. For that, you need three-dimensional reconstruction, because obviously if you do So for proving that you have a, a channel, you will really have to do three-dimensional reconstruction. But anyway, this is just an afternoon. Now, in this case of the nuclear pore complex, um, uh, it's, it's, the situation is, as the name said, very complex. And um, uh, let me take through it step by step. And uh, I apologize to those uh, cell biologists, particularly um, people like um, Elspeth Lund and Jim Dahlberg and uh, Hans Ries, who have been uh, major contributors to the field um, by going through some of the rather basic uh, slides which I'm showing here in the beginning and perhaps not discussing the latest uh, uh, SDS gels or the latest uh, curves that we have, but, but uh, primarily focusing on concepts. We had this morning a session with Elspeth and Jim, and they asked me all the questions, and I still am looking forward to another session uh, with them to ask them all the questions. But um, we have to schedule some. But in the first slide, uh, maybe we should turn it off in a plunge in the dark. So this is what I would really like to discuss with you. First, the nuclear core complex, what we know about the structure and what we know about the function. Then the transport factors, which interact with the nuclear core complex and with transport substrate to get things in and out of the nucleus. Then I would like to discuss something uh, uh, which uh, is very exciting, namely that there are several distinct transport pathways. So there is not just one, but there are at least four, and there may be as many as ten different uh, transport pathways of how you can get things into the nucleus. And there's also a, a, a futuristic project which will have to do with internuclear transport. And I've just seen the wonderful pictures which Hans Ries has produced on, on intranuclear structures, particularly tubular uh, structures. And uh, so uh, there is a great deal of excitement, and this is a project which will uh, receive great attention, I predict, in the next couple of years. And then there is just one or two slides on export, and we, as you will see, we know very little about a nuclear export as of this moment, other than that there are a number of distinct pathways, but the factors which mediate a nuclear export remain largely uh, undiscovered. So uh, let me start out with this uh, offensive slide to many of you just to say what we are talking about here. The nuclear envelope is a double envelope membrane. The inner membrane continues with the outer membrane. The outer membrane, of course, is the same as the ER. And so then you have these circular openings of 100 nanometers. And uh, they are filled with a nuclear pore complex. And underlying this and connecting the nuclear pore complexes is the lamina, a structure which was first described in, or one of the principal people who described the structure was Fawcett, and he called it uh, very correctly a fibrous lamina. It was already in the literature under the name of Zonina Nucleum Limitans, if you like Latin names. Uh, Hans probably remembers them. Uh, and uh, uh, Fawcett, in a very keen insight, realized that these structures are fibrous in nature, and in fact it was shown that the lamins which compose these uh, composes this structure is actually made up of intermediate filament type protein, so it's in fact the fibrous lamina. 
And so um, then, of course, there is, um, uh, and I apologize, these slides are a bit dirty, uh, but uh, there is connected to the um, interchromatin, to the, to the lamina is, is, is heterochromatin, and from the nuclear pore complex extending into the interior, you find often the euchromatin. And that you can see in images which I've taken from Fawcett's book, The Cell, and you can see this very nicely here. This is the inner nuclear envelope membrane, outer the nuclear envelope membrane, here are the pore complexes, and you can see that euchromatin always ends up in these uh, uh, nuclear pore complexes, and heterochromatin is in between. And so here is a very dramatic case, if you can focus this a bit, uh, of the red cell of chicken erythrocytes. And the chicken erythrocytes or the bird erythrocytes keep their nucleus, and you can see it's mostly condensed chromatin. And wherever you have U chromatin, you see here the nuclear envelope, outer membrane, inner membrane, there's nothing much in the cytoplasm here. And you see it's beautiful where the U chromatin ends up at the nuclear periphery, there's always a nuclear pore complex. And so this is an example of a cell which has very few nuclear pore complexes. And here's a cell which has a record of nuclear pore complexes, the amphibian oocyte, uh, which has something like 50 million nuclear pore complexes, where you see one after the other on the, the nuclear envelope. And in fact, it has an excess of nuclear pore complexes in the cytoplasm, and they're called annulate lamellae. And as the cell undergoes mitosis, these uh, nuclear envelope, of course, uh, falls apart into vesicles and the nuclear pore complexes are disassembled and so are the annulate lamellae. The annulate lamellae undergo the same disassembly, reassembly cycle in mitosis as does the nuclear envelope. And these are simply stores of nuclear pore complexes in the cytoplasm. And it is from these images, freeze fracturing images, that you can count the number of nuclear pore complexes. And Gerd Maul, in particular in the 70s, has done a great deal of counting. And so that we have, uh, uh, you, you, you know from the size of the nucleus, you can reconstruct how many nuclear pore complexes there are. So it is known that yeast, for instance, has 200 nuclear pore complexes, and even oocytes has 50 million. And the average vertebrate cell in our body has about two to 3,000 such nuclear pore complexes. And uh, they are not always equally distributed. That is, again, a picture of, of, uh, from Fawcett's book. In this case, you see in a spermatocyte, you see the nuclear pore complex all at one end of the nucleus. And they are not uh, randomly distributed. But again, I won't go into this. But from amphibian oocytes, one could isolate uh, these uh, nuclear uh, uh, envelopes by, uh, by simply by, by, uh, by, by using squeezes. One could mechanically isolate them. And, uh, and, and they give these very beautiful images in negative staining. And from many other images, then, what has been reconstructed is a very low resolution model of the nuclear pore complex. And what uh, the most important features um, which are shown here in these nuclear pore complex models uh, uh, will have to be revised because it's a very low model. And as I was just discussed with Hans Ries, there are many problems with this model. I mean, one of the models problem is this nuclear envelope lattice, which probably does not exist, and is just a collapsed structure interpreted as a collapsed structure which uh, consists of fibers which extend from these what Hans Ries has called fish traps, which he discovered a couple of years ago, extending from the nuclear pore complex into the nucleoplasm. Hans also discovered the fibers extending into the cytoplasm. So both of these fiber structures um, in uh, isolated nuclear envelopes uh, collapsed upon the structure and therefore were very difficult uh, to visualize. And they have now been visualized through the methods which Hans Wieses has been used. And he can give you a talk and tell you in detail uh, what these structures look like. They're very important structures, as you will see, because they play an important role in nuclear transport. Because it turns out that these fibers contain uh, the docking sites for transport factors to get uh, the protein into the nucleus. Now again, uh, uh, the model of, of, uh, of Christopher Ecke uh, suggests that there is in the center of the nuclear pore complex a tube. And that, that tube has a diameter of about 26 nanometers internal diameter. And it is postulated that traffic goes through this central tube uh, of 25 nanometer internal diameter. So if the protein conducting channel in the ER would be 2 nanometers in diameter, this is 25 nanometers in diameter. So there's a diameter which is about the size of a ribosomal subunit. So even a ribosomal subunit, while passing through this uh, central tube, may not have to be unfolded uh, going across. 
But in any case, as I said to you, this is a, uh, a low resolution model, 90 angstrom, and there are lots of features which will have to be changed, and I mentioned some of them. For instance, the nuclear envelope lattice is probably is, is a fiction, and it is actually collapsed fibers which extend from this uh, 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 fish trap into deep into the nucleus. Uh, and then here, uh, so what you essentially have in the center is this tube in, uh, which is suspended by these spokes and rings in the center of this 100 nanometer wide hole. So here you have the nuclear envelope membrane, outer membrane, inner membrane, you have this circular 100 nanometer wide hole. It's suspended in the center is this tube and anchored to this hole by rings and spokes is the central feature and emanating from these are these fibers into the cytoplasm. So uh, what, what do we know about the biochemistry of the structure? I mean, the knowledge is by no means complete. We are still in the inventory phase, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, which we have passed in the case of the endoplasmic reticulum. We are out of the inventory phase and now are going into the phase of structural biology and of biophysics to understand how the structure works. Now, we are not at this point with a nuclear pore complex. There are in yeast uh, probably 60 or so nuclear pore complex proteins, somewhat less than was estimated originally, it was estimated maybe 100 to 200 proteins in the nuclear pore complex. Our latest estimate says that it maybe is uh, 60 distinct proteins making up the nuclear pore complex. Now, uh, how did we get there? And uh, this, uh, showing, I'm showing you here a rat liver uh, uh, nucleus. And Laura Davis, when she was a graduate student in Rick Wozniak, also a graduate student in my lab, made monoclonal antibodies against uh, isolated nuclear pore complex laminar fraction from rat liver. And what they then um, observed in immunofluorescence is this wonderful uh, pancreate pattern when you look on the surface of the nuclear, uh, on the nucleus, and when you look, when you focus on the equator of the nucleus, when you focus on the rim, you see this beautiful punctate rim staining. And this suggested that uh, particularly this antibody was reacting with a nuclear pore complex, and in fact, by doing immunoelectron microscopy, we could confirm that this is, in fact, a nuclear pore complex protein. And this sort of punctate surface staining pattern has been sort of diagnostic for nuclear pore complex protein and has facilitated identification of these proteins because it avoided doing the cumbersome electron microscopy and allowed to do the much quicker immunofluorescence to diagnose what your antibody reacts with. And some of these proteins then were cloned out and um, um, what we found in the beginning uh, is that they shared certain features uh, together. And this was a group of proteins which reacted with a monoclonal antibody that Laura Davis and Rick Wozniak produced in our lab called MAP414. And uh, this protein reacted with a bunch of nuclear protein, pore complex proteins, which we now call nuclear porins. And uh, these nuclear porins share these repetitive uh, compact motifs. And uh, these, these repetitive peptide motifs which react with a monoclonal antibody, giving rise to this poly polyspecificity. And here is then an immunoelectron microscopy of one of these <coughs> nuclear uh, complex proteins we call nucleoporin. In this case, it's the nucleoporin of 358 kilodalton, also called NUC358, which was cloned in sequence in our lab and simultaneously also in Nishimoto's lab. And then what we have done here is some immunoelectron microscopy, and you see very nicely that it decorates the gold, the tip of these cytoplasmic fibers emanating from the nucleoporin complex into the cytoplasm. So, if you do this sort of analysis for some of the other nucleopore complex proteins which have been cloned in sequence, what you find is that, that these fibers emanating into uh, the cytoplasm and into the nucleoplasm are composed uh, of, uh, uh, of different nucleopores. So, there is these fiber structures are uh, asymmetric. <coughs> Um, the, the, the cytoplasmic fibers, for instance, at the tip have NUC 358, and then there's also NUC 214, uh, which incidentally also turns out to be an oncogene uh, called um, 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 CAN, uh, for those who work in oncogenes. And um, uh, NUC uh, 68 is localized on both sides. Uh, it's not known precisely where. NUC98, also an oncogene, uh, as it turns out, is localized on the cytoplasmic side, and uh, on the nucleoplasmic side, and so is NUC153. And so how deep 
the NUC 153 extends into the nucleoplasm is still being worked on. Uh, uh, Hans Ries has just, uh, no, uh, 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 Werner Frake has uh, pictures where showing that NUC 153 can extend deep into the nucleus. Uh, Uli Ebi has pictures where suggesting that NUC 153 is part of the terminal ring of the fish trap. So there is a, a, this sort of sub-localization is going to be a very long and laborious job to find out where all of these 60 nucleophore complex proteins are localized. So it's, for those of, you know, it reminds me a little bit of the story of the ribosome when I grew up and where people argue about ribosomal proteins, you know, which one is, uh, in what spectrometry are they present and how many are there and so on and so on. And of course, we, you all know that we have all the ribosomal proteins now, the structure and sequence of them, but we still don't know exactly how they function. And I'm afraid that the nuclear pore complex will have a similar fate. It will take a long time until we figure out how all of these proteins function and will be for the next generation to really solve this problem of of the structure and function of the nuclear core complex in detail. But what we know is that these repeat containing nuclear cores on both sides, on the nucleoplasmic side and on the cytoplasmic side, provide binding sites or docking sites for transport factors, which I will talk about a bit later. Okay, so uh, now here is a bit on the electron microscopy of transport, and this goes back to Feldhurst's early studies where he has injected uh, a gold particles coupled to nucleoplasm and into the cytoplasm. And from these sort of images, you can see how the gold particles accumulate on both the nucleoplasmic side. Notice here, this is nucleoplasmic accumulation here, and as well here, and as well as here, as well as on the cytoplasmic side uh, of the nuclear pore complex. So you have a high concentration of these, of these nucleoplasmic gold particles in the, the nuclear pore complex on both the nucleoplasmic and the cytoplasmic side. And so it's from these images that people were convinced that the traffic goes through the center of the nuclear pore complex. And actually what uh, Felter has also done, he labeled he, uh, RNA and he attached RNA to gold particle injected into the nucleus to small gold particles and protein to large gold particles injected them in the cytoplasm. And he could show images where uh, the small and large gold particles met near the same pore complex. So the idea is that all pore complexes are created equal, that they they can all do import and export, and that there is no difference between these four complexes. And this is very much the debate which also uh, 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 ravaged about the ribosomes for many years. Are all ribosomes equal or are they the same? And we, we sort of, at the field shares the opinion also, I mean, there may be some dissenters, that all of these nuclear pore complexes are in a way similar and they all can do both, traffic in and traffic out into the nucleus. Now, it is not just protein traffic which they can do, but also RMP traffic, SNRPs, for instance, uh, are assembled in the cytoplasm and go back into the nucleus, and of course, messenger RNP comes out. Then also, uh, a DNA, of course, adenovirus uh, particles have been shown to dock to the nuclear pore complex, and DNPs can go into the nucleus. So it's a multi purpose organelle, but the recognition probably is all protein mediated. The docking and transport process is probably a protein mediated process. Uh, also, this has not been completely proven either. Uh, so here I'm showing you uh, the same picture with uh, Richardson and Lasky published in 1988 in Cell, and they did exactly the same experiment as the uh, um, uh, uh, felt her. They injected these nucleoplasmic gold particles in the cytoplasm, and the preservation is not very good. You see the nuclear envelope here, and you see pore complexes here, and you can see how extensive actually these fibers extend into the cytoplasm. Much longer than actually most images suggest. So these fibers may be a bit longer than, than, uh, than the images suggest, but of course it could also be an artifact that they have been somehow doing the preparation of the specimen uh, have been uh, altered or changed. But uh, you can very nicely see the docking in multiple docking sites. Please remember this, multiple docking sites on the nuclear pore complex. There is a model which has recently been proposed where there is only one docking site at the end of the tibus and the fibers bend over and it deliver the substrate to the, to, the, to the center of the nuclear pore complex. These old images suggest that there are in fact multiple docking sites. And so we favor that there are multiple docking sites and so that these fibers are like, like uh, uh, tentacles of a jellyfish which extend into the cytoplasm and, and allow concentration 
of impulse substrate on these fibers and allow exclusion of proteins which do not have uh, these so-called nuclear localization signals. And this exclusion of cytoplasmic proteins is very effective for large proteins. But it's not as effective for small proteins. So small proteins, uh, proteins lower than 40,000, can still have access to this zone of concentration and can therefore diffuse across a nuclear pore complex. But we think that these fibers are really concentration devices which concentrate substrate uh, 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 for import uh, subsequent uh, diffusion, perhaps down a concentration gradient or some other mechanism uh, into, into the nucleus. Now, here's another picture of, uh, of Houston Swift from 1966. I'm just showing this because these are the precursors of the more modern pictures which Bertrand Danahol is publishing in Cell recently, looking at a very large messenger RMP, uh, in this case of, of uh, chironomous salivary glands, and insect salivary glands, and they make these silk-like molecules, very large molecules. And you can see the messenger on these. And what, uh, Bert, uh, what uh, Houston Swift uh, uh, tries to indicate in these pictures that uh, that they, these large particles have to unfold while they're going uh, through the nuclear pore complex. They are 50 nanometers in diameter. And as I told you, the central diameter of the tube is only 25 nanometers. So you would have to unfold this particle to get across. And here you can see these dumbbell-like structures and here you can see half of it is in the cytoplasm. Interesting enough, you see some ribosomes uh, here in the neighborhood. And what Bertel Danhold has shown is that the five prime end of messenger comes out first into the cytoplasm and then engages ribosomes immediately for translation and even attachment to the endoplasmic reticulum in the case of these silk messenger RNA molecules, which of course have signal peptides, right? So there is sort of a, a, a co-transportational translation, if you wish, while the messenger RNP is transported through the uh, nuclear pore complex. Initiation of translation can start at the 5 prime end uh, and, and as, a, as a particle is being transported. And here you can see that the process is almost completed. And here the process is the particle is completely there. And another particle is still approaching this on the cytoplasm. Of course, now we know that maybe these particles don't exist as particles anymore, but they immediately engage messenger RNA for translation but of course it could also be that some particles are unable to mediate, to immediately engage messenger RNA and are visible as particles. So it's, uh, anyway, this is what Houston Swift's pictures suggest, that some of these messenger RNAs do not immediately engage ribosomes. So uh, how about the biochemistry of transport? And I don't want to go into the entire history, but um, it's, it's sort of very interesting that the channel for transport was in this field discovered first. In 1959, uh, the nuclear pore complex was discovered. Um, Hans, uh, correct me if, if I'm wrong, by somebody called Watson, and, uh, not the famous Jim Watson, but another Watson who worked at Rockefeller. And, uh, but uh, I, I would like to have correction if I'm wrong, if I'm discrediting or discrediting somebody. But anyway, the, the pore complex was discovered as early as 1959. But the signal sequence which directs you to transport uh, was discovered very, very late, only in 1984. And the opposite is, case, is the case for transport across the ER. The signal sequence was discovered first and the channel was discovered last. And, and the reason for that, of course, is because the nuclear problem is so big. Now, not, the signal signal is not necessarily small, but it was usually thought that somehow things can diffuse into the nucleus and you don't need a signal sequence at all. And it was from the studies on the SV40T antigen um, and mutants of an SV40T antigen where this lysine was mutated to a threonine and where people could show, Calderon and others could show, that uh, actually this particular protein containing this mutant threonine could not be imported into the nucleus. And they were subsequently able to show that this particular peptide is the region where the information for nuclear transport lies. Now, another important progress was made when David Goldfarb in Roger Conrad's lab was able to, synthet to, to synthesize this peptide and couple it to a, to a reporter protein by chemi chemical coupling to its cysteine and uh, was able to fluorescently label uh, this uh, reporter protein, in this case it's human serum albumin, and then injected into oocytes and was able to show that this uh, reporter protein with 
the uh, signal sequence, the NLS, so-called nuclear localization signal, covalently attached to the cysteine, could drive the reporter protein into the nucleus. Whereas if you attach a mutant signal peptide with a threonine on it, uh, you did not get import into the, uh, into the uh, nuclei of these injected oocytes. And this was very important because uh, unlike in secretory proteins where you cannot get translocation of a completed protein across the channel, heat shock proteins are needed to keep it in an unfolded configuration and so on because the channel is only two nanometers uh, estimated or 20 angstrom in diameter, whereas of course the, the central tube is 25 nanometers, so it's laughing at, uh, at uh, human serum albumin. It uh, can easily uh, get across and it doesn't need to be unfolded. So this was an important uh, breakthrough and another very important breakthrough came in Steve Adam. Uh, as a postdoctoral fellow in Larry Gervais' lab, and they developed the cell-free system. That was really, in my, view, in my view, the beginning of the biochemistry of nuclear transport. They developed a cell-free system which was very ingenious. They just took tissue culture cells, uh, permeabilized the plasma membrane with digitonin, which is rich in cholesterol, and the digitonin, of course, does not touch the nuclear envelope, which doesn't have much cholesterol, and leaves the nuclear envelope and the endoplasmic reticulum intact, but leaches out all the cytosolic components. And what Steve Adam and Larry Gerace were able to do is to add cytosol back, and they could show that the fluorescently labeled NLS-containing substrate was now imported into nuclei in the presence of cytosol, but was not imported in the absence of cytosol. And of course, the control, the mutant peptide, uh, was not important either. So in this uh, reduced the complexity of nuclear import to a simple biochemical system. I shouldn't say simple, because it took quite a while to take apart what is in, uh, in uh, the cytosol fraction. And here, Mary Moore has made major contributions. She was a postdoctoral fellow in my lab. She took the cytosol and uh, really fractioned it. And what she found is that there is two fractions, fraction A and B, and fraction A is involved in NLS recognition and docking of the NLS substrate to the nucleophore complex, and fraction B is involved in the translocation into the nucleus. Now, historically, she purified first the components in fraction B, and this was independently also done in Mary Gervais' lab. And uh, so the fraction B uh, activity was the first one which was purified, and I will talk about this later because there was quite a surprise in that, but I will, uh, because you know, first you have recognition and docking, I will first talk about the fraction A uh, purification. And again, this was done in several laboratories simultaneously, leading to several different names. But the first one who purified it, unequivocally the first one is Steve Adam uh, at Northwestern, uh, and he called them NLS receptor and P97. And uh, then subsequently, it was independently purified also in other labs, in Juan Lasky's lab, in our lab, in, in, in the Japanese lab, in Leda's lab. <coughs> and we all gave them independent names. And we call uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, activity in the fraction A karyoferin, meaning bringing to or taking from the nucleus. Cario, of course, you recognize, and ferrin has the root ferry in it, the Staten Island ferry, bring to or take from the nucleus. And we deliberately choose this very vague Greek term. Uh, other people like uh, Lasky and Gerlich have chosen the term <coughs> importing. Uh, but we think that important may also turn out to be exporting. So it's, it's always more advantageous if you choose vague Greek names, which do not make too many claims on the function. And Caryophyrin seemed to be to us such a name. And so there were alpha and beta subunits. And um, uh, so we were able to make recombinant proteins, of course, other labs as well. And so this is some work of Yonona Maoriano and Aurelian Radu. And they made the recombinant subunits in E. coli of alpha and beta. And neither, one, uh, neither of them alone gives you docking of the fluorescently labeled substrate. But when you add uh, uh, both of them together, alpha and beta, you get beautiful uh, docking to the nuclear periphery, and this is the same sort of docking that you get with fraction A. So it was clear that the fraction A activity contained these two purified proteins, chiropen, alpha, and beta, that, uh, that uh, uh, docked uh, uh, the substrate to the nucleus. And we now know that alpha recognizes the NLS, and alpha then uh, docks uh, the NLS uh, alpha 
binds to the, the dimeric complex binds to beta. In fact, alpha and beta form a heterodimer in the cytoplasm and it picks up an LLS, NLS substrate in the cytoplasm. Okay, so what we have here then is, uh, you see here the import substrate in green and it binds to chiofan alpha and the chiofan alpha in turn binds to chiofan beta. And the chiofan beta is able to bind to, bind to these uh, uh, repeat containing nucleoporins. So it can bind to NUC 358, it can bind to NUC 214, it can bind to uh, P62, uh, which is probably somewhere in here, it can bind to NUC 153 and NUC 98, which are on the nucleoplasmic side. So there are nice binding sites for cariofan and beta in all of these repeat containing nucleoporins, and they are, in fact, in the region of these nucleoporins, which contain these multiple peptide repeats, but uh, it is not known whether they are actually the concept that the, whether the docking site is, is, is by the repeat motif itself or whether there are regions between uh, the, uh, the repeats. That is not known at all. So then uh, let me talk about the purification of the B activity and this was in fact the first uh, 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 nuclear transport factor that was really purified to homogeneity by Mary Moore and that was a very great surprise. It turned out to be RAN that had had been cloned and sequenced and it, it was named uh, because it is a RAS-related nuclear protein, therefore it's called RAN, and it turns out to be a GPAs. It's a very abundant protein, 0.4% of the HeLa cell proteins is RAN, so it's very abundant. And when we tried to publish the paper, of course we were, we were uh, uh, asked to go back and back and back because uh, the reviewers just wouldn't believe that such an abundant protein has anything to do with nuclear transport, and they were suggesting to us that we should look for some other faint bands. Even so, we had shown that the recombinant run uh, was active in the system and it was as active as the purified run. But sometimes you have these problems uh, with this paper, and I'm sure that you have all experienced them. I've made the experience that the more important the paper is, the more trouble you have in publishing it. The more mediocre the paper is, the, the more readily it, it, it is accepted. Uh, so, but in any case, RAN, I think, was really a breakthrough because what it really said to us is that, that a small GTPA plays an important role in nuclear transport and as it turns out, not just in nuclear import, but also in nuclear export. Now, subsequent, Mary purified and so did Larry Gerace a protein which interacts with RAN and uh, which we call P10, which was also called NTF2, and um, uh, I think that's all uh, for, for names at the meantime. But this interacts with one, and we know uh, a little bit about how uh, these proteins interact. I won't spend much time on that. So uh, what happens then is somehow after docking, RAN and P10 get, uh, get the proteins across, uh, it looks like that the alpha subunit gets into the nucleus, the substrate gets into the nucleus, but the beta subunit remains behind. It's indicated here to remain behind at the nucleoplasmic fibers, but we don't know this in fact. But it's very clear that you have a dissociation of alpha and beta from each other, and then also of alpha from the substrate, and both of them enter the nucleus, and the beta remains behind at the nuclear core complex. Uh, of course, this may simply be a result of kinetic partitioning. It may be that the beta actually enters the nucleus and is very quickly exported again. So we cannot distinguish between these two things. Now, a very important finding was made by Mike Rexach, when he, a uh, uh, postdoc in the lab, when he uh, found out that actually uh, RAN GTP, but not RAN GDP, works in the dissociation of alpha from beta. So if you add to uh, alpha beta heterodimer RAN GTP, the RAN GTP forms a stoichiometric complex, a, a heterodimer uh, with, with the uh, chiofan beta, and the alpha is dissociated. So this, is, uh, this gave uh, us some indication of how RAN may work, namely after docking, RAN would dissociate the alpha and the substrate from the docked beta and would then allow transport by whatever mechanism, diffusion or whatever you favor, into, into the nucleus, through the central tube of the nuclear core complex. So this was a very key discovery. And more recently, uh, Monique Fleur and, and, and Mike Rexham have shown how this uh, uh, both chiofan and beta and RAN GTP is recycled, and they have shown that alpha, uh, based on earlier work of 
Nona Morogliano, showing that, that alpha and RAN bind to overlapping sites in beta, that alpha can actually uh, destabilize the interaction uh, of RAN GTP with beta. And then uh, this destabilization in the presence of RAN gap which is a RAN GTP as activating protein can lead to the conversion of RAN GTP to RAN GDP. And this is how we think the, uh, this cardiothelian uh, data and the RAN is recycled. I don't want to go into a more mechanistic details the fact that RAN gap is in the cytoplasm and therefore in the cytoplasm presumably there is primarily RAN GDP and uh, this would make sense because you do, do not want in the cytoplasm high concentration of RAN GTP because it would uh, lead to a dissociation uh, of this heterodimer and it would lead to this uh, somewhat futile uh, dimeric complex between beta and RAN GTP. And so in the cytoplasm you have RAN gap uh, localized the GTPS activating protein which converts most of the cytoplasmic RAN GTP into RAN GDP. Also I warn you that there are no precise measurements how big the pools of uh, RAN GTP and GDP are in the cytoplasm and the nucleoplasm. This is all extrapolation from the fact that the RAN gap is localized in the cytoplasm. Okay, so this was an important finding. Another important finding, in my view, was the finding of Ulf Neerbas, and this was published in Science about a year ago, that P10 plays a very important role. First of all, P10 can bind to repeat-containing nucleophones very much like cardiothelium and beta plus. P10 can also bind to beta. And most importantly, P10 can bind to RAN GDP, not to RAN GTP. And of course, we know that with very low affinity, RAN GDP can also bind to better, very low affinity. So what, uh, what Ulf has shown that if you give to, these, to this complex, which was assembled from recombinant proteins, if you add GTP, you get an exchange of GDP for GTP, and the RAN GTP now dissociates the alpha and, uh, uh, and the substrate, of course, and you would then uh, uh, have, uh, so what this suggests is that the explosive, which is namely the RAN GTP, is not generated in the cytoplasm because you have high concentrations of RAN gap, but the explosive is generated in C2 near the docked uh, cariophane heterodimer. You use P10 to bring the explosive RAN GDP in its inactive form to the cryophane heterodimer. Then you do an exchange for GTP that acts as an explosive and this, uh, dissociates the alpha from the beta. Uh, what happens afterwards, of course, uh, we don't know exactly. But these, I think, are very key reactions. Now, we thought that this is all wonderful and all very nice, and this is the end of the story. Uh, until uh, 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 Mike Rout and, and, and John Asensen, uh, when the yeast data bank came out, looked at um, the yeast data banks and found actually that there are homologs of the beta subunit. And so we were forced to, talk, to turn the original beta subunit beta 1. And uh, what we have now characterized are three more beta subunits beta 2, beta 3, and beta 4. And they each go with distinct nuclear localization signals, uh, which are also known under different names. And in order for conformity, we would simply suggest that the NLS, which is cognate for a specific cardiophane beta, is simply called NLS2 goes with beta 2, NLS3 goes with beta 3, NLS4 goes with beta 4. So we don't precisely know what these NLSs are. The only case we know is in the case of Gideon Dreyfus, which has termed this NLS the M9 sequence because it was identified in a messenger RNA binding protein. And the corresponding protein in mammalian cells was also discovered uh, contemporaneously in Gideon Dreyfus's lab together in uh, also his work which we did in our lab in mammalian beta 2 and he called the protein transporting. Now I will take you through some of the yeast data uh, uh, regarding beta 2 and will also perhaps show you some data regarding beta 4. And uh, what Mike Rout and John Asensen did, uh, they replaced the endogenous copy of the yeast gene, uh, uh, in this case it's just an open reading frame, and tagged it with a protein A tagged version of the gene with some selectable markers. So it was, for, it was possible then to take the beta 2 gene 
uh, copy and replace it by this protein A tag copy of the gene. And uh, that then allowed uh, to do immunofluorescence, that allowed uh, to, uh, uh, to show where the protein is and to isolate interacting partners. And I will quickly give you an example of this. So uh, what Mike and John Aitchison showed is that the protein is primarily in the cytoplasm with a little bit of nuclear rim staining. Uh, they also could show that Mike Grout had been able to isolate nuclear pore complexes and it was part of the nuclear pore complex. But this is what I think is really a very nice way of looking for interacting proteins. Uh, what is this new uh, cariofarin, which has a molecular weight of 104 kilodalton, as, as opposed to the original beta subunit, which has a molecular weight of 95 uh, kilodalton? Uh, what, is, what does it bind to? So what they did, they took the protein a tag version from the cytosol, they put the cytosol, here you see the total cytosol from acid blue staining uh, uh, profile, and here you see the uh, uh, light and a heavy fraction of membranes, and uh, uh, here you see a, f a flow through from, from the cytosol uh, through, the, through a column which contains a mobilized IgG. And so then you go in with a magnesium chloride gradient, which is from uh, somewhere from 500 millimolar to 4 molar. And uh, you can see that uh, at, uh, at 500 millimolar, there is not much coming off magnesium. But then as you go to higher concentrations, you get off a, a certain uh, distinct proteins here. And at very high magnesium concentration, 4 molar, you get off the, uh, uh, the cap 104 protein A packed protein. So this is a beta 2, which is protein A tag. And we have shown this here by, um, by, by Western blot. Um, uh, and, so, and, and so then the question was, what are these two proteins which are binding, obviously, very tightly to this beta 2? And they turned out to be well-known messenger RNA binding proteins, which in yeast were called NAP2 and NAP4. So uh, these are very well-known messenger binding proteins. And if you look, the stoichiometry of these proteins is approximately right with regard to the stoichiometry. So this is a silver stain uh, uh, to, to the cryotherian um, uh, 2, or CAP-104. Now, uh, if you do the same thing with the CAP-95 protein, of course, you get the alpha down. And you get also, this has already been observed by Laura Davis, you also get a certain amount of NUP2, which is a nucleopore down, which may be a cytosolic nucleopore, which is not completely integrated into the nucleopore complex. We don't know what the significance of this finding is at the moment. But you get alpha down when you take the CAP95. And of course, you get all the other substrates down, but you don't get any major substrates, so they don't stand out as, as a sharp band. And it's only because these two proteins, these two messenger RNA binding proteins, are major substrates that they stand out and that you can easily identify them. So we did an uh, actual <coughs> sequence of these two proteins and we could show that there's on up four and up two. So uh, what these data then suggested is that this cariofarin, the beta 2 or the CAP 104, is a transport factor or a docking factor which specifically, specifically recognizes sequences in, in these two yeast proteins, NAP4 and NAP2. Now we look whether these two proteins, NAP4 and NAP2, have an M9 sequence that have been identified by Dreyfus in the mammalian counterparts of uh, uh, the A1 protein, and it does not. There is no resemblance between the M9 sequence and uh, corresponding sequences in NAP4 and NAP2. So at this moment, we do not know uh, in what uh, region uh, the signal sequence, the NLS, the NLS2, if you wish, of the NAP4 and NAP2 are located. Now, so this is a way of pulling out your substrate. If you can lower the light a little bit, because this is immunofluorescence in yeast, and yeast is much more difficult to show immunofluorescence because the nucleus is much smaller. If we can turn down the light a little bit, and you see uh, what uh, John Asians and Mike Ward have done, they have produced a temperature-sensitive mutant in CAP-104. Um, uh, and so uh, they have shown that um, that at the non-permissive temperature, uh, at 37 degree, uh, after one hour, you can see the protein is, is the great, after three hours there is very little, this is the western blot of the protein that remains. And so when they looked uh, with, a, uh, uh, with a tagged 
uh, NAP2 uh, um, uh, protein, where the NAP2 protein is, it's zero, which is a, 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 this message on the binding protein, you see that uh, at, at zero time point, it is primarily in the nucleus, right? You see the nucleus staining. Uh, but if you look at one hour at the non-permissive temperature, you can see very much that the nuclei are spared. The nuclei are very small, so here's a nucleus right here. Here, this would be this nucleus. In Darby's setting, it is spared. Uh, and also here it is spared. So uh, the, it, the, at the non-permissive temperature, the, uh, the, uh, the beta 2 is unable to import uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, mess this messenger on a binding protein. But it has no effect on, uh, a, on a green fluorescent protein which is coupled to a classical NLS or to an NLS1, which would be imported by the alpha beta 1 pathway. And you can see, uh, even at three hours at the non permissive temperature, this particular substrate is still imported into the nucleus. So it's very clear that this is another pathway which. Uh, brings a, 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 a subset of nuclear proteins, in this case, a messenger RNA binding proteins into the nucleus. I want to stress, however, that not all messenger RNA binding proteins use this password, because from the uh, tremendous uh, work that uh, Gideon Dreyfus has done, we know that there are also, um, among the 20 or so messenger RNA binding proteins that have been characterized, there are also some which have classical NLS1 type nuclear localization signals. And so they probably can go in by the alpha beta 1 pathway, but uh, this has to be determined in detail uh, for each of these proteins in the future. Now, so here then what we have in summary is unlike the alpha beta 1 pathway, where we have the beta docking directly, the beta 1 docking to the nuclear pore complex, and the alpha serving as a mediator for binding to to the NLS1 containing substrate. In this case, we have the beta 2 binds to the nuclear pore complex directly and to the substrate as well directly. There's no mediation uh, by an alpha subunit uh, involved in this case. And this is also the, the case in the other two carrier beta 3 and beta 4, which I will briefly describe. They also bind directly to the substrate and uh, the bind directly to the nuclear pore complex. <coughs> And there is no alpha subunit involved. In fact, we could speculate uh, in evolution what the meaning of this is, but uh, I don't want to take up too much time on this. We can perhaps discuss this in the discussion section. Um, now, this is a couple of uh, mammalian uh, uh, beta 2 experiments that we have done. Uh, um, Neres Bonifaci has independently of. Uh, of, uh, of um, <coughs> hidden drivers also found in mammalian proteins, and we're just, just going to be published very briefly. And you can see that uh, the chiropharin beta, uh, which uh, is bound to fluorescently labeled GST uh, protein containing the mammalian messenger RNA protein A1, can dock to the periphery of the nuclear pore complex uh, when you do uh, the reaction at zero degrees. And if you do the reaction at room temperature, uh, the beta 2 can bring a, 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 the protein into the nucleus, uh, but the RAN, if you add RAN GTP, you can see that you get a much more increased uh, import into the nucleus. And what is particularly striking that the nucleoli are not uh, uh, um, uh, occupied by this, by this particular substrate. And RAN, G, and PP, and P inhibits this process. We germ agglutinin does as well. And the RAN mutin, which doesn't uh, uh, hydrolyze GTP, also inhibits this process. Now, we found that um, you need RAN only if you use higher concentrations of beta-2, such as 2 micrograms. If you use lower concentrations of beta-2, like 0.5 microgram, there's no difference between plus, minus RAN, and plus RAN. And it could be that in this case there's enough endogenous RAN still left uh, to do the import and that we, when we do the higher concentration of beta, we need exogenously added RAN. But all of these things need to be figured out because it is clear that beta-2 does not bind RAN GTP directly, as does beta-1. So we have to find out who brings uh, the RAN GTP into the vicinity of uh, beta-2 and what actually happens precisely. These are all things which remain to be figured out in the future. Now, um, this is just, uh, again, I will skip this. It binds to various nuclear points. And um, uh, this is a, a competition experiment. 
will be used as the NLS1 substrate going in this beta 1 alpha run P10. And uh, we show that in the presence, in the absence of beta 2, there is nice import, but in the presence of beta 2, you have competition for import. And the same is true with the other pathway. If you have the GSTA1 labeled and you take beta 2 and run, you get in the absence of beta 1 no inhibition of import, but in the presence of beta 1 you get inhibition of import. And this is explained by competing that these beta, all of these beta subnets may compete uh, by binding to overlapping sites on the nuclear points because they all bind to this repeat containing nuclear points. But of course, you know, we are far from, uh, from, uh, from understanding what precisely is going on. We obviously have to do kinetics here. We have done some, but of course, it, 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 again, it would take too much time to go into detail. So I will move on and um, uh, we'll quickly discuss now some other uh, uh, cryofans in the beta 3 and beta 4. Um, uh, and uh, here, again, the same strategy. Beta 4 is cup 123 p again, work of Mike Rout and John Aitchison. Attack with protein A and the same strategy. And what you see with the magnesium chloride gradient eventually, because you you, uh, you elude the beta 4 or the CAP 123, and you elude also in this uh, 500 millimolar region of magnesium a bunch of, of specific proteins. And if you if you uh, overload the gradient and blow this up a little bit, and you can see that there are actually quite a few proteins in there. And we have done sequencing and mass spectrometry, and they all turn out to be ribosomal proteins. So what beta-4 is doing, it is a transporter for ribosomal proteins. It brings in the ribosomal proteins into uh, the nucleus. And again, uh, this was demonstrated by the usual uh, experiments uh, uh, which one can do in yeast, um, uh, in vivo experiments, showing that it is specific for ribosomal proteins and does not uh, affect uh, uh, import of, of, of other proteins. Of messenger RNA binding proteins, for instance, or of the NLS1 type containing proteins. So it is really specific for these ribosomal proteins. Now, the very big shock was when we knocked out the gene and found that this is not lethal. So, I mean, how come that, that, uh, that a ribosomal transporter is, is not required for, for, for survival? Right? And that, of course, makes no sense. So, what then Mike and John found is that CAP 121 or previously also isolated as PSE1, as promoter of, uh, enhancer of secretory pro of, of protein secretion. Somehow this uh, protein was thought to be involved in protein secretion enhancement, uh, but now of course we know that it is a chiropharin which uh, can bring in ribosomal proteins to the nucleus when you knock out beta-4. So beta-3 can substitute for beta uh, for beta 4. And uh, when you knock out beta 3, it is lethal because uh, beta 3 must be doing some very critical proteins. And of course, if you knock both of them out, uh, 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 obviously, if you knock both of them out, they're lethal too. So, um, so it, it, this brings up already uh, sort of one of the dilemmas which we are facing, namely that there may be overlap in the recognition of various substrates in these various transport pathways and uh, that these uh, CAP-123 or the beta-4 may have uh, developed in yeast uh, to deal with a very large volume of ribosomal protein import that is required. Uh, what Mike Rout and John Asianson calculated is that uh, knowing the number of ribosomes in yeast and knowing the generation time, they calculated that there are 15 ribosomal proteins imported per second per nuclear pore complex. So this is only talking about ribosomal protein not about messenger and RNA, transcription factors, and all sorts of things. So this is a very highly active transport organ. 15 per second is uh, very respectable for this uh, sort of thing. Now, of course, they have also shown in the control that E. coli ribosomal proteins, for instance, do not bind uh, at all to, to, to carifan uh, beta-4 in overlay acids, whereas uh, the, the yeast ribosomal proteins do. And in fact, it turned out that the ribosomal proteins of, the, of, of uh, yeast are all larger because they all have to, of all eukaryotic ribosomal proteins have to carry a nuclear localization signal, which E. coli ribosomal proteins don't have to carry. And so the ribosomal proteins are larger in all eukaryotic cells because they have to carry an NLS to get the protein into the nucleus for ribosomal assembly. And this is probably also the reason why the ribosome in general is larger in eukaryotes than it is in prokaryotes. One perspective, some people may disagree with this uh, simple analysis. <coughs> 
of things. But in any case, here is cryophane and beta 2. Again, like beta 2, it binds directly to this repeat containing nuclear proton proteins and to the substrate. Now, um, <coughs> the story is still not finished because further inspection of the data then shows another at least 10 proteins which we think are cryophane beta homologs, and we are busily identifying the substrates. We have identified alumina, some substrates for them. And so they indicate that there are other pathways for tRNA, for instance, for SNRF uh, proteins and so on, which are using separate and specific pathways, and there are other cryophanes which are involved in this. And of course, the fascinating question which is raised by these results is that these pathways can be independently controlled. And so the cell has a way to control the import of these various uh, nuclear proteins in a, in a separate way. And this is going to be a very exciting topic for the future. But now I want to quickly go into what I think is even a more exciting topic perhaps for the future, and that is intranuclear transport. And people have always thought that intranuclear transport is just playing the fusion to all of this uh, mass of of to the viscous mass of chromatin. And there were some people who have calculated that uh, certain large particles in a viscous medium like the nucleus wouldn't diffuse uh, uh, very far. The debate would be very, very slow. There are some theoretical papers dealing with that. And so I've always been attracted by the idea that there may be a stationary transport substrate in the nucleus, either in forms of fibers or tubes, and this would be these stationary transport uh, uh, materials, these fibers or tubes or whatever, would be gaining uh, the interior to the nuclear pore complex, and it would be along these fibers that transport would take place. And so um, uh, here is a protein which Tom Meyer in our lab discovered a couple of years ago, uh, the NOP140, it's a nuclear protein. I'm afraid if we don't turn off the light, we we'll turn it off completely. Uh, pitch black, um, uh, you won't see anything. Um, what Tom looked at is, uh, is it um, labeled did some immunogold electron microscopy on frozen thin sections. And uh, what you see here is very badly preserved because it's a frozen thin section. You see the nuclear envelope here, and you see the cytoplasm here, and you see the nucleoplasm. And this structure here is a nucleolus. And for those of you who sit in the front row, I doubt that for those of you in the back row, they will see it. I don't know which lab you turn up. Maybe you can do that. Because I'm, I'm afraid you want to, ah, you have to tip the right button. Maybe it's better to be visible now. You see these gold particles, here's one, here's one, uh, extending for a distance of microns from the nucleolus, this is a nucleolus, all the way to the periphery to the nuclear envelope. And we have actually some images where uh, you can see these gold particles on both sides of nuclear core complexes. So the question is raised of whether, in fact, uh, there are these curvy linear tracks. Uh, and the question is raised whether uh, uh, transport, in an, uh, intranuclear transport, is not just uh, by diffusion in, in some sort of unstructured uh, and, and nucleoplasm, but that there are some uh, stationary uh, transport phases, fibers or tubes. And uh, what I was most fascinated uh, by today is when Hans Ries was able to show me his pictures, which he has taken. You have to ask him to give a seminar very urgently, because these are among the most beautiful pictures I have seen of the interior of the nucleus, where you in fact see eight fibers emanating from the nuclear pore complex from microns into the interior of the nucleus, forming actually what one could call a subway tunnel system, uh, in which um, uh, he has shown in some collaboration, in collaboration with, with uh, Elspeth Lund, may actually, and, and, and Jim Barberg may actually be involved in transporting things to the nuclear pore complex. So these structures uh, will be very important. And the question now, what are these structures? And there is a very fascinating, pro fascinating protein which has been um, discovered some time ago uh, called TPR, uh, which stands for, uh, I forget what it stands for, but it's an oncogene also. And uh, this protein has been initially localized um, uh, to the cytoplasm, but one then was correctly localized uh, by, by, um, by Volker um, uh, Cordes and Werner Franke to uh, the nucleoplasm, forming fibers which extend from uh, the nuclear pore complex into the interior uh, of, uh, of the nucleus. So uh, uh, the challenge now is to show whether the fibers that Hans Ries sees 
these eight fibers which emanate from the fish trap, as he has called it, from the terminal ring of the fish trap into the nucleus, whether these in fact are TPR or whether they are TPR plus something else. I suspect that they are TPR and something else. Now, what is very interesting about this protein is that it has a very large coiled coil of it of uh, 1,500 amino acids, so it could potentially form a, a, um, a coil, coil of something like 150 nanometers. But I think the periodicity which Hans Ries has seen is only 50 nanometers, so that there may be, and not the entire protein may be coil, coil, but as you see, I'm speculating and waving my hands. Uh, but this is very exciting, and it will probably give us a tremendous number of clues for a nu internuclear transport. Now, Mike Rout and Katarina Slambio di Castiglia have found yeast homologues of these two, uh, of these proteins. Uh, there are two homologues, and we are basically characterizing them, trying to pull out interacting proteins, and so on and so on, doing the same strategy that we have used for the better supplements. So here is then what I'm saying is that these fibers uh, probably in this cartoon, uh, which is sort of prescient, I would say, they continue into the interior of the nucleus, and so that uh, the space, intranuclear space, is some sort of tubular system, uh, you know, not necessarily continuous as indicated here, but perhaps open-ended in the cytoplasm, where then, uh, which serve as stocking sites for a, a two-dimensional diffusion, if you wish, along these tracks of fibers uh, and export or import into the nucleus. So the intranuclear phase of transport is going to be a very fascinating one. Now, I won't go very much into this um, uh, thing about export uh, uh, because time is running out, but what we think is that the caryophane alpha, which goes into the nucleus, may also serve in taking out NLS-containing substrates from the nucleus by a different mechanism. This mechanism does not involve caryophane battery, but it may, and, and again, it wouldn't take too long to go into the detail, so that you actually could have a merry-go-round of certain NLS-containing substrates. And the only way you can, you would prevent this merry-go-round is if you anchor uh, the substrate either in the nucleus or in the cytoplasm. And NF-kappa B, for instance, is a classical example of how you can anchor this protein in the cytoplasm. As you know, the NLS1 of NF-kappa B, which is a transcription factor, is covered, is covered by I-kappa B, and you have to first phosphorylate I-kappa B, then the ubiquitinate it, then the degrade, then degrade it, and then the NLS of this transcription factor, NF-kappa B, is available for nuclear import. And then somehow in the nucleus, the NLS is probably inactivated because it's part of the uh, of, of, of a DNA binding site. And so therefore, only when you take it off, it probably would be subject again to export. So you can immobilize the protein by anchoring it in, let's say, chromatin or some other nuclear substrate, and you can immobilize it in the cytoplasm, in this case, by this very complex mechanism. In my last slide, um, I just would like to to get, come back to the pictures which I showed to you uh, uh, early on from Houston Swift, in that you have these very large messenger RNP particles, uh, which need to be unfolded while they are going across the nuclear core complex. And what we suggest is um, that, of course, these very large messenger RNPs will have many proteins bound to them, all of which may have, or some of them may have, nuclear localization signal because we don't know of what type, NLS 1, 2, 3, 4, it, it needs to be figured out what type of proteins are the critical ones. And it is with these analyses that, that and, 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 and the corresponding caryophane embedders that you can then be docked to uh, these uh, 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 nuclear pore complex repeats and uh, this uh, docking would be, uh, uh, this unfolding would be initiated at the 5' end, perhaps via the cup binding proteins, and therefore you could explain perhaps why the 5' end would come out first. It would be initiated at that point, and then it would proceed further downstream from, from there by multiple docking to these multiple docking sites of these repeat continuing nuclear points. You would convert a croissant, so to speak, in a millipede, and you would therefore uh, allow its diffusion across the center of the of the tube, but this is of course wide speculation, and this is just a model, and you can at this moment entertain other models. But uh, this um, this is, uh, I think, all the slides which I have uh, to present. So, uh, just in summary, we have a long way to go to understand the structure of the nuclear core complex. 
this which will never be a challenge which uh, 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 will go on for a long time. My Grauden, Chris Aki are doing vitreous ice electron microscopy in half an hour resolution, which the thing is down to 25 angstrom, and we are eagerly awaiting their, their, mo their new models on, uh, on these isolated core complexes. But again, you know, the, the complication there is, uh, as Hans Ries has pointed out, that when you isolate nuclear core complex or when you take nuclear envelopes, these fibers collapse upon this rupture. In addition, you have chiophane beds plus transport substrate bound to the fibers. So you get a horrible mess, uh, which is very difficult to sort out. So ideally, what you would like to look at, you would like to look at a core complex which perhaps doesn't have any fibers, and which perhaps doesn't have any transport substrate uh, bound to them, and then you would get an idea of what the, what the core of the core complex looks like. And you would like to perhaps study the fibers independently and independently of the transport substrate. So you can see that in spite of the efforts of very powerful electron uh, structural biologists, we, we are at a very low resolution of the nuclear core complex, and that is of course the key if we want to understand how transport works, and if we want to develop hypotheses of how the transport works. Now, in transport factors, uh, we thought you know it would be a simple story, and we ended up you know with this multitude of transport factors and transport pathways, distinct pathways, and this will also take a long time to all figure out, and it will be a challenging. Uh, a, a it will be a great challenge to figure out how these pathways are all regulated. And then I, I mentioned briefly uh, 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 intranuclear transport will uh, play a very big role, and then I have not discussed much on export. Uh, I just wanted to say that there is a signal which has been called nuclear export signal, NES, uh, uh, which is presumably involved. But uh, uh, other than identifying such an NES, uh, there is not much more progress of how this NES works. Um, it is also possible that the NES is actually not a signal sequence by itself, but is a, is, um, is a piggybacking sequence which attaches um, these proteins to uh, bona fide NLS 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, whatever, containing proteins, and that, it, that, the, uh, that the export uh, of, of these NES containing proteins is actually not via direct interaction with export factors, but with some other factors. So, in summary, you see that this is a field which is very much in turmoil and a very lot of hand waving. And, uh, but it's, uh, for, for these reasons, very exciting because uh, as of this moment, there are several hypotheses, and everybody has their own favorite ones, how it works. And uh, this is good in a way, sort of like coming back to Mao Zedong in sort of other fashion, said, let a fl thousand flowers bloom, uh, let a thousand hypotheses bloom. Eventually, one of them will be supported by enough data, or several one of them supported by enough data so that we can, that it, it, that it acquires credibility. Uh, and so this is giving you, uh, this lecture was trying to give you a short overview over where we stand in understanding this whole thing. And I apologize for those of you who are specialists, particularly in Elspeth Lund and, 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 and Jim Dahlberg, if they were hearing a lecture which they all knew everything about, and there was not much new, very much like the lecture I gave yesterday, which wasn't that much new either. Uh, in other words, I refrain from showing our latest sort of uh, uh, data slides on that, but it was more important for me to get across the concepts and, and uh, you know, for those people who do not work in the field and for those people who work in the field, I'm happy to go and discuss details. Well, thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry.